so an initial challenge uh, on joining uh, Janelia was to uh, see if one can basically image um, neural circuitry in the fly brain was one little example. So a lot of the initial effort back then was trying to understand what are the technical requirements for doing that. And electron microscopy was the way to go. You know, this Paul microscope really wasn't an appropriate tool. So I thought, well, electron microscopes, okay, let's just, we, we just investigate that. Uh, there's a certain sized volume. Uh, there's a certain size resolution needed to see individual neurons and trace them, which means there are a certain number of samples if you divide this by that. And if you can sample it at megahertz, you find out you're talking about years of operation and also years of imaging has to be perfect. You know, you can't have a gap, otherwise you don't know how nerves on one side connect to the other. And those simple requirements sort of led to a long-term development or exploration of what is the best way to do this. There are a number of standard techniques in the field at the time, uh, cutting with a diamond knife and imaging through it, or putting those sections onto a surface and imaging that were modes. Winfred Dink at the time had just developed an alternate approach where you cut a surface and look at the exposed surface with backscattered electrons uh, with SEM. And we were exploring the quality of the data and we decided to go for this one new option, uh, which was to uh, look at it with the FIPSIM. So instead of using a diamond knife for cutting, we used a focused ion beam for cutting. So the idea is you scan with an electron beam and then you ablate with an ion beam, scan with an electron beam again and ablate with an ion beam. And each time you get a picture of a surface and you form a 3D stack of images. Um, the big advantage is that with an ion beam, as opposed to with a diamond knife, you can take very fine sections in Z and you don't end up with this little choppy quality of, of, of the data in Z. And that allows you to resolve potentially very fine processes in, in better detail, uh, which was especially difficult for the fly. So we ended up developing this technology a, a little bit. We tried it initially. Actually, we bought it, tried it. Uh, after three days, we could image a tiny volume of the entire thing. It's still daunting. The machines aren't that stable. And maybe not to do uh, full justice, we actually had a very big problem. This machine's not reliable for more than a few days, so we had to think hard. Um, what's a big, a good physics solution? Uh, you yeah, know, the solution. Uh, we just have to make it reliable for a few years. Um, so, easily said, but not that easily done. So, after about 10 years of tackling this problem and trying to in understand all of the limitations on it, able to restart it gracefully, control the beam, anything that could damage or get in the way of, of perfect data, we managed to tame this ion beam. Actually, you have to understand the cutting is almost more important than the imaging. Uh, and it's underappreciated, but it's very important. And so with this, we got this machine to work. So like one of the little innovations here is to monitor the beam uh, as it strafes over the sample, use that to feed back and stabilize the beam uh, on, on different channels. Um, and we put that all together and first pass, we're able to image a larger part of the fly. This is now with three months of operation. This is the optic lobe. You can see the fly has a lot of wiring inside its little brain. Uh, if you zoom in, you're seeing, you know, this crisscrossy braided pattern, the chiasm. you saw a nucleus go by. The dark little circles are uh, mitochondria. And as when it stops, you'll see little bright areas right here. These are the actual synapses that take place. But then we ran into another problem. <clears throat> this machine uh, can't mill depths greater than about 50 microns. The ion beam essentially gets a little bit in, unstable. So if you come on in with an ion beam, you image it, you make sort of a burnt crust, 
and the cutting gets a little bit unstable as this burnt crust interacts with the milling beam. And I, I like to use the analogy, it's very much like wind coming on a pond. It looks good on the upstream side, but as you get downstream, uh, there are waves and instability and cutting non-uniformities, which get more and more aggressive. So we had a problem again uh, and thinking hard, well, if 50 microns is too much, let's keep the samples less than 50 microns. Uh, so we cut them without splicing loss. And this is where Ken Hayworth came in and he developed this hot knife technique where you can take the fly brain, cut it up like a loaf of bread into let's say 30 sections. And this allows for very nice parallelization. And now we can go into uh, two machines. Currently we have a, a fleet of eight machines doing this kind of uh, work. Initially, this allowed us to get a, a data set, which we call the hemibrain, <clears throat> which is just this uh, middle portion of the brain, which contains uh, the smell, navigation, sleep functions. There are a lot of little different parts and modules in here, uh, which you can access. And just to show you, <clears throat> this is what a couple of years worth of imaging looks like. Uh, this round object here is the ellipsoid body. It's part of the fly's compass, its navigation system. You know, if it's headed one direction or another, you see different nerves. Uh, and you can see it's very modular. And those are the cut sections you can see there very easily. And you can zoom in <clears throat> into this. Now, this data itself, um, we, we need to first find all the synapses. And having FibSim was very helpful because it allowed <clears throat> good quality data so that one can define find these synapses um, not manually uh, but by an automated technique with a reasonable reliability because we have to identify presynaptic and postsynaptic structures um, and then each one of these nerves has to be uh, segmented and and traced and again the size is such that you know, you really need the computer automation. And magically, while we were taking this data, the uh, progress, you know, in doing machine learning and neural nets and, uh, you know, is just sort of come in, you know, with perfect timing. <clears throat> so we then teamed up, this is very ambitious, with uh, uh, Google, and they've developed a, a flood filling uh, routine, and they have more computer resources than we could ever dream about here at Chenelia, so it's a very good collaboration. And they basically trace all of the uh, neurons in that data that, uh, that we have. <clears throat> it's not perfect, we still need to go, sometimes two neurons get joined and we have to cleave in certain places. And there's a team of about uh, 30 to 40 people who do that work to clean it up, but then in the end, one can have, you know, data sets, you know, that look like this. This is the ellipsoid body that you have seen again, just with about eight neurons labeled. And they tied to some other structure called a protocerebral bridge, all used in uh, directional information. <clears throat> you zoom in in certain areas and you can see where the synapses are between two neurons. And with that, you can sort of get you know, the complete connectome uh, information just out of that one little module right there. So in reality, that part of the brain is just filled with different modules. You get thousands of neurons, millions of connections, and this is actually the subject. Uh, it's now been put available and there's a whole community uh, using that data and it's gone to the next level of making it available and really developing the proper tools to mine and explore the data uh, and, and query it in, at a level that you know, biologists you know, are interested in. So what we've done with all of that, <clears throat> I'd like to think of it in terms of this uh, space. There's size of the sample, you know, which might be a cubic micron all the way up to cubic millimeter uh, at this place right here. Um, typically at the micron level or less, TEM 
standard electron microscopy really gives superior resolution and has been sort of the uh, mode that people have operated in. Um, the vertical scale here is resolution. Um, on these other diamond techniques, we're limited in the Z resolution by the cut thickness, uh, but with FIBSIM, we can actually now access a large sample volume region with a little extra resolution that was previously not available for biologists. And the fly brain, which represents about eight FIBSIM years of, of imaging, which we're doing right now, not just hemi brain, but hopefully a complete brain, um, is situated in, you know, in, in this space right here. <clears throat> so to access that data, we operated our machine with uh, an extra high electron beam, a little extra current so we can get more throughput. So we can basically image this whole fly brain uh, in a reasonable part of um, a postdoc's or a scientist's lifetime. You know, that, that is a constraint. Um, however, if we wanted re more resolution, we could drop the current um, you know, and work down here in this place. Uh, aperture smaller, less current, so we take much longer to get the same uh, resolution, uh, so get better resolution. Um, but we have to uh, suffer with much smaller sample sizes. Um, so what is resolution? Let me just sort of quickly give an example. Uh, we like to use a internal standard. Ribosomes appear often in these images. They're ubiquitous. And one can just literally you know, make cuts uh, across in X, Y, or in the Z direction. And we like to measure as a step edge, you know, from one level to the other, whether we go 37 to 63% or 20 uh, to 80%, you know, when people have resolution, they have slightly different definitions, but I'd like to sort of standardize this. And the nice thing about a step edge resolution standard is that it's independent of the staining level. Um, you know, it's, it's not like traditional TEM, uh, on just vitrified samples where, you know, contrast of atoms is, is a, a standard. Here staining comes in as a variable and you'd like to have a, a microscope measure which is independent of that. And so the kind of numbers uh, can be extracted and one can sort of compare. So if we use our, let's say 20 to 80%, you know, we have uh, about seven nanometers for XY, maybe about 10 nanometers uh, for the uh, Z direction. It's a, a little fuzzier in that direction. So they're almost isotropic. So long story short is we are now targeting another space in here, uh, which is smaller. See, it's not as big as the fly brain, but a little bit lower, which means we have uh, you know somewhat higher resolution than we have on the other one. And typically we take it with smaller voxels, um, of say about four nanometers for, for reasonable sampling. And this is what it would look like. Here's a, a fly brain sample taken under one condition and another condition where we've dropped the current uh, by about a factor of 20 uh, to achieve a, a much crisper image. <clears throat> and here's an example of what such fly brain tissue looks like uh, under these conditions. Um, So <clears throat> with data like that, you can begin to look at a little bit more subcellular detail. And uh, uh, it can be manually segmented uh, for small volumes, like here a uh, collaborator was tracing out the endoplasmic reticulum. You can sort of find the uh, different components, the uh, mitochondria, plasma membrane, see where things are making physical contact, and, and really quantify things you know, in a new level. And we'll revisit this, uh, you know, in, in many ways, uh, you know, different ways later. And another point is the richness of the data. This actually, this is your uh, cilia from uh, or the flagella of a chlamydomonas, and you can just very easily collect lots of these data sets. Uh, the resolution isn't quite as good as you might have with the TEM, uh, but it's very easy just to get, uh, collect it. A cross-section of its nucleus 
might look like this if we just colorize it instead of using black and white. Data is very rich. Uh, so how to analyze it? One thing is you can just mask out. If we just mask out the surface of the nucleus and look at just the outer membrane, just by itself, gives you a picture like this. Here you can just see these string of pearls everywhere, which are polyribosome um, ribosomes, just covering it in between are the nuclear pores. In the past, with traditional TEM, where you don't have this holistic view of the cell, you might be fortuitous just to cut across the plane of a nucleus or maybe an ER in the right way and see them. But here you can get sort of a holistic measure of, of, of the cell. So inspired by that, we thought, well, maybe here's a chance to maybe get some standard whole reference cells, uh, such as the HeLa cell, at the highest possible resolution. Let's spend one month imaging and make that somehow available for mining. So there's a nucleus here. You can see the polyribosome chains on the nucleus. You manually segment out the, the mitochondria. Um, still, this is a, a very limited part of the whole data. Here we just zoom in in a very small region. You can see a centrosome, one microtubule. This is one of the things with this resolution. You can actually pick out microtubules in the hollow core on it. Golgi up here, nuclear membrane, nuclear core, chromatin, heterochromatin on the inside, and all of the individual nucleosomes. The spots up here are probably uh, ribosomes, maybe part of polyribosome chains. Um, and this, we started a group to really take a very serious look at the data and to first annotate it and then segment it. And one can, uh, there was a, a team led by Aubrey Weigel, now called the COSAM team at Genelia, where they have segmented out a tiny volume on the order of a cubic micron for various structures. And that, you know, can be used to train uh, a neural network to segment out the whole rest of the cell. Uh, like that. So here you can see you know, all of the mitochondria, the whole ER, nuclear surface. And if you really want to see and play with that, um, a lot of data sets have been put up on this website called Open Organelle. Um, and, you know, you're invited to, you know, just explore, uh, see the different segmentations. You can download, you know, put it in Fiji. Um, and maybe try to define one's own biology uh, from this. Here's another example. Um, I don't think this one's on open organelle with a collaborator where we're looking at mouse liver. This is just to give a few feelings, uh, examples of what can be done. Um, <clears throat> and they wanted to see what does the mouse liver look like under different uh, glucose conditions. And so this data is relatively easily acquired and can be segmented out. There are commercial places that also do such segmenting too. And you can identify contact sites and the like. So for them, uh, they found a difference between the whole structure of a lean and obese mouse. The liver in lean one has very nice sheet-like structure. Go to the obese, it becomes very tubular, it looks very disorganized. Um, and this can now be characterized. Lipid droplets are introduced. So now, again, one has sort of a holistic way of trying to characterize uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, states of a cell. So at this point, I'd like to move on <clears throat> to the next subject, which is adding another layer of information <clears throat> onto those electron microscope images. They're, they're beautiful by themselves. I mean, you can, people have learned a lot from electron microscopy. The heavy metal stain is largely labeled the membranes. It has beautiful <clears throat> global context. You see a lot in there, um, uh, but it's a little bit nonspecific. For the most part, doesn't really care what proteins are there. It's just a, a generic heavy metal stain. While fluorescent microscopy just lives in the opposite end of the world. 
you target one very specific protein, you know, one or two out of the 10,000 that are there. And back to the old palm days, you often lack context. You see little glowing blobs, maybe of single molecules floating in darkness. And that was disturbing to us then and is still an important limitation. But putting the two together really tries to get the best of both, both worlds. And this, this is the work of a, you know, collaboration, you know, with a, a number of people. Uh, and I'll focus in on a few results from David Selecci as, as part of this. So, of course, everybody knows GFP. Um, and, of course, GFP is way smaller than the diffraction limit. And, of course, George Patterson, who we mentioned earlier, developed, you know, uh, enhanced switching capability, so it could be useful. And this was some of our very first results taken at NIH a long time ago, where we developed, you know, the palm microscope using his labels. These were vesicles um, or poly uh, lysosomes. So to take it to this other level, uh, what we'd like to do is combine super resolution microscopy with electron microscopy. And typically, the preparation for electron microscopy is very different uh, than for light microscopy. In the one case, you want very strong chemical fixatives. In the other case, you want to preserve antigenicity or not kill the fluorophores. And you end up often sort of fighting this little battle between getting the best of one and not trying to lose that of the other. Turns out, whoops, an alternative is to explore cryofluorescence. In other words, instead of chemical fixation, we can just try cryofixation. We freeze it. And actually, this fits in very nicely to a protocol for FibSim. Uh, the protocol uh, simply looks like this. You culture cells, high pressure freeze them, uh, you freeze substitute, and then you uh, stain them with epoxy, you x-ray, you trim, and then you do FibSim, and you get your FibSim image. Now, right here, while it's cold, <clears throat> we can take this vitrified sample before it's stained, uh, load it onto a little uh, sample holder, and transfer it in into this little cold box, keep it at uh, 10 Kelvin, and then image it with the uh, you know, an objective sitting at room temperature and the rest of the room temperature uh, structure is behind it. It could be either structured illumination or palm. And what happens at low temperatures, uh, the fluorescence really changes. Uh, things freeze in, singlet oxygens can't move around, things become highly stable. So instead of a fluorophore which bleaches away quickly, it can become close to immortal. Um, and so we can get a lot more photons out of it, <clears throat> which compensates to a certain extent having a lower NA objective um, and, uh, you know, makes things possible. So 3D uh, SIM, which was our initial goal, <clears throat> you know, could work pretty easily. <clears throat> it works at liquid nitrogen temperatures, don't really need to go down all the way in temperature and you can get nice overview details of cells. And it's, it's a relatively quick technique. And plus it also works in, yeah, as I say, 3D, there's a third dimension. Because of the stability, you can get multiple focal planes without bleaching it uh, that rapidly, which is a nice benefit of the cryogenic conditions. Now, one thing as we explore different fluorophores, we learned that, oh gosh, indeed, some of these fluorophores really do blink very nicely, which of course brings up the idea of doing localization microscopy. Um, it's slow. We sometimes take, as in the old days, you know, maybe a day uh, to acquire such a data set. Um, but, you know, the nice thing, it's a technique that inserts into this process flow, uh, but literally does not compromise the quality of the FibSim image at the end, since we, we just Take it out, keep it cold, image it cold, keep it cold, put it through the rest of the process. And now the two images can be overlaid to give the correlative image. So now we've added another dimension of color onto this area. 
actually I maybe was presenting that a little bit optimistically, the resolution of the color is not as good as the EM, uh, but sort of sits up here, but you do have this resolution data underneath uh, available. And <clears throat> just to, um, you know, prove the feasibility or get confirmation that it works, here are some areas of another uh, cell, I think this is the cost seven cell, stained both on the mitochondria and on the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look carefully, you might see a, an image of the mitochondria where uh, TOM20 is used as a label. And underneath, you can see the, you know, the FIBSEM image of the same mitochondria. And same thing happens for ER labeled. You know, here's the membrane ER underneath. And you can find corresponding areas of the, of the ER there. So there's some errors. There's a little uh, correction uh, for registration that needs to be done. And we worry about the accuracy of this registration. It can be done by hand uh, using uh, the big bore tools uh, that have been developed by Stefan Salfeld uh, and is available in Fiji, you know, as a plugin. And we can just sort of remap the cell, the optical data onto the actually map the FIPSM data onto the optical data. When you go through this free substitution process, things move just a tiny bit. But in the end, we can sort of get in the range of 30 nanometers kind of uh, net errors if we uh, cross compare the data to itself. So here's a, a close up optical image, EM image, and overlay, you know, looks nice. I and mean, even these little varicosities that you see here in the ER are, are true, they're not artifacts. And here's another example that actually initially surprised us very often. If you just see a little fluorescent spot somewhere in the image and you'll just dismiss that as some noise or as being insignificant. Uh, so here's a yellow spot associated with a, a ER3 label color or TOM20, uh, which was you know, labeled with a, a JF225. The other one, we like to use M emerald as a fluorescent protein on the other color. Um, but if you look at the EM images, you'll see, by gosh, at that same location, there's a tiny little vesicle. And over here for the TOM20 label, there's also a very, very similar looking little vesicle. Um, so what we've gotten here, uh, we actually do a further characterization beyond what EM can do to really say, uh, what is this vesicle? Or at least what's the cargo, what's the contents, or maybe any surface proteins that might be associated with that. <clears throat> and we can do this in a complete way. Here we label just proxosomes in a HeLa cell. And we can see in the EM, it looks like this, this little, uh, you know, surrounding structure. Another one, so it has a little bit of a curved dish shape. Here's a, yet another one. And we can just do this for all of the proxosome spots in a cell and get a complete characterization of how many there, there are. Without combining the two, you know, we'd be left a little bit in the dark of, you know, is this truly a proxosome? Is it some other kind of vesicles? To, you know, because their shapes do vary a little bit. Um, so one can get, you know, nice comprehensive statistics on the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> here's another example. Here we label a membrane. Uh, this is done with Dave Selecci. Uh, and uh, two, two colors, JAMC, which is a membrane protein, which sits on the interface between these two uh, uh, granule neuro neuron cells, and uh, Debrin. And if you look carefully at that, on the EM side, you see there's a dark stained, a little wiggly light stained part, a dark stained part. And mechanically, you could, or just directly, you can manually segment out those very clear, distinct regions, uh, but they also correspond to the different fluorescent proteins uh, that light up there. And you can then form either a fluorescent image of that interface between the two cells or a segmented or annotated uh, EM image. And you can just sort of see a 3D structure of this interface, you know, very directly uh, between them and able to 
you know, quantify those, those regions associated with the two different proteins. And here's yet a, <clears throat> another example. Uh, again, that David Sletchy provided the samples for and motivated. Um, these are uh, progenitor neural cells. Apparently they form up here, migrate down below and differentiate um, you know, into a, a, a neuron. And in the process, you know, the size of the nucleus and characteristic changes a lot. The size drops by a factor of two. A lot of heterochromatin seems to condense uh, very much. And now we can combine, you know, with labels, you know, for the different kinds of uh, uh, chromatin. You know, there's a histone 3.3, um, which largely labels the heterochromatin, but there's always a question of, you know, the dense regions that you see in EM, how much are they really related to certain histones? And you can look at different overlaps, you know, between the various protein labels and things that you might segment out from the uh, EM images. And, you know, or HP1, a different uh, histone label there, which sort of seems to label things which are more toward the surface as opposed to the interior of, of these neurons. And finally, I thought I'd just sort of give you one more little example. This is actually a, <clears throat> a video taken with Eric Betzik's uh, lattice light sheet microscope some time ago. And uh, the samples provided by Alex Ritter, presently at Genentech, where you see a <clears throat> immune cell uh, attacking a cancer cell a T cell attacking a cancer cell. And these little red spots are lytic granules that it takes, moves forward, and eventually tries to destroy, poison essentially the cancer cell. Um, we can have that activity take place on a cover slip. That's a three millimeter cover slip with cryofluorescence microscopy. We can get an overview. We can zoom in and find a particular cell pair, which is in the right stage of being attacked. There's a T cell at the bottom in green. And then that particular cell can then be imaged by, by Fibsen. And you can see just from the structure how the, uh, the T cell, so here we're seeing an immunological synapse. And you, this T cell is actually going around cupping part of the, uh, you know, the poor HeLa cell right here. You can see a little bit of a cup right there. <clears throat> And if we zoom in to this area of uh, where it's connecting, we see the immunological synapse. And essentially, you think, gosh, this is, here's, this is a war zone going on right here. Dark spots are the lytic granules. Uh, the centrosomes are up here, which is typical for the immune cells tacking. Uh, the HeLa cells, the, the mitochondria are turning black here, and it's suffering. It's throwing up actin networks. It's shedding membranes. Certain proteins are being expressed as it tries to shed its membrane and uh, repel the attack. I mean, this is biological warfare that's fiercest. Um, so, so let me try to summarize. Um, so what we have here, we have again now added now a layer of color information. Uh, on on top of this, uh, and we're operating all in this larger this new space. And I think there's you know a considerable amount of work to do. You've seen the raw data. Um, a lot needs to be done to take that raw data to a semi-interpretable form, just with the uh, segmenting. It's it's a whole new paradigm of challenges that uh, you know are, are present. You know. There are thousands of proteins eventually to overlay onto these uh, samples and thousands of samples under thousands of different conditions. Uh, it's, it's really a little bit of a, a whole new world. And, you know, and I think very, very exciting world to be in right now. Never, you know, getting into this, you know, through this path, never could imagine that there's so much, so much to do here. And with that, I'd just like to just again point out sort of lab members. Uh, David Hoffman was doing a lot of the cryo palm sim work. My colleague Eric Betzik, 
Gleb, who was working hard on the uh, cryo uh, eye palm uh, aspects uh, or cryo palm aspects of it. Uh, Sean and Ken, I did, there's a whole new other project here that we're working on right now, trying to get even higher throughput using a multi beam um, microscope, which right now looks very promising too. Um, so we can look maybe close to millimeter size samples and try to make sense of that. But uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions. Thanks. So thank, thank, you, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. So if you have any question, you can either ask them in, in the chat or raise your hand. I see a question already in the chat. Should I, should I, um, sure, so you sure. go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's a question. Uh, what is the sample volume and the correlative imaging technique? Is it possible, for example, to image the whole brain of a fly in this correlative manner, fluorescence uh, and, and 3D? Oh, spin? gosh. I should, should just appreciate what we've got so far. <laughs> <I know. laughs> more, give uh, us more. <laughs> yeah, the, the, it's true. The volumes are, of course. Uh, sort of at the few cell level, you know, we can get small tissues or cultured cells or right now in sort of the, you know, the sweet spot. Um, and sizes of that are, you know, maybe 60 microns on a side and maybe 10 or 15 microns in thickness. Uh, still, still rather modest. Um, but you're right. I mean, there, there's a whole region of biology uh, which is just waiting to be touched. Uh, uh, thicker samples uh, of tissue are readily imaged by FibSim, uh, you know, like the liver and other things like that that I showed, or pancreas. There are just so many samples that one could go after uh, with relative ease. Uh, making this work on the correlative, I would say, is still work in progress. Soon as you begin to look at samples, which are thicker than maybe 20 microns, you might want to be a little bit careful about optical distortions. Maybe we have to mix in a little bit of adaptive optics as that comes in, um, you know, as, as we, de you know, image deeper. Uh, there's a limit of maybe 200 microns associated with high pressure freezing. And, uh, but still, Micron what, what do you samples. think about? Um, sorry to interrupt. Sure. What do you think about these uh, computational techniques that uh, infer what the fluorescence might look like? And given that you can do some correlative, could you apply those that you know that so, that sort of training? I know that Aubrey uh, Wheels take a taking a, a an approach with uh, kind of um, manually labeled EM data. But could one use the, the fluorescence correlation data to do more in terms of? Yeah, yeah. I, I always approach that a little cautiously. I mean, there's, a, it's, a, it'd be cool to sort of see, you know, can you infer, you know, train and infer, uh, or actually do a little extra interpretation then on the EM data, like, uh, there's enough information that this vesicle, because of its location and other attributes, probably has a mitochondrial protein in there. Uh, I'd be highly cautious about there because cells are still very complex and I'm not sure if the full reliability is there. I and mean, it's worth exploring. Um, I think one should quantify it uh, and certainly not go overboard on it and saying, okay, we correlate I, once. I suspect it as much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, otherwise we have nothing to do, right? <laughs> Indeed. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, it's from Dominique Bourgeois. He thanks you for a wonderful talk um, and asks whether JF525 and JF549 blink at cryo temperature to be able to perform cryo SM, LM palm. Um, and do you know what their photophysical mechanism for switching might be? Uh, okay. Um, they, they do blink. There's a, be a nice set. 
you know, we, you know, depending on, you know, other little labeling constraints, yeah, they would form a nice, somewhat spectrally distinct pair that one could, uh, you know, separate out. On the actual, you know, you know, hardcore photophysics, I, I, I see that also as something where one would need to go in and really understand what's really going on. Is there some little hydrogen thing popping off at some place? Is it a, a spin state? You know, is it shell triplet states? You know, I, I think a definitive experiments on that are, are lacking. Yeah. You know, I think there's plenty of room for speculation. Uh, perfect area for more research or theses. Um, I mean, I've <clears throat> coming from the perspective of Eric Nabetzik and I a long time ago, <clears throat> you know, we were looking at, uh, you know, single quantum well states in a semiconductor and you can put fields on them. You can sort of split them into different components. There's a quantum mechanical way that you could begin to describe at a very you know, explicit level, what's the source of the fluorescence? What energy levels are you going from? What's what's changing? Uh, <clears throat> this is a much messier system. You know, you're in bio stuff, you know, for lack of a better term. <laughs> it, it's highly disordered. There's a lot of inhomogeneous and homogeneous broadening mechanisms going on. Uh, there are chemical changes. Um, so I, I think it's a rich area to, to explore. And I'll, I'll just avoid answering that. <laughs> Thank this you, Harold. Open, this is an open area. <laughs> I'll, I'll let uh, Mi Michael yeah, so ask his question. Thank you for a wonderful talk and really great pictures. Uh, I was wondering like uh, concerning like, uh, okay, the registration of the optics, uh, optical channel on, on top of, of the electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. So is this like, uh, can you get away just with the rigid body registration or uh, could there, are, are there like distortions or how, 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 I mean, potential distortions? Uh, how do you handle that? Right, right. Um, I think in certain areas, rigid body is a good approximation, but uh, in a vitrified sample, we should probably get a good absolute coordinate mm -hmm. system, you know, to the extent you trust the optics and have that well characterized. Now, as the follow-up processing, there's a, a free substitution step. You know, the water gets taken out of alcohols and particularly around the nucleus or the higher parts of the cell, it might shrink maybe 10% enough to cause some grief on the registration. And particularly there, there might be larger distortions. And so I think as a rule for doing correlative uh, on this kind of protocol, it's important to have internal cell reference markers. Uh, you know, let's say like mitochondria or nuclear pores or you know something that's in the area of interest. The closer the references are, you know, the more accurately you can account for this, you know, potential. 10, 20% global distortion from, let's say, just the, you know, the free substitution process. Um, okay, thank but, you. Yeah. Unfortunately, what I've heard recently is that even the nuclear pore complex, which seems like such a, uh, you know, uh, as, as sturdy, <laughs> <laughs> can dilate and, you know, change depending on the, this the state and the, the membrane tension. Oh really? Okay. So, oh, this is yeah, it's, yeah, oh, it's really fascinating. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just when you think you have that that internal standard, <laughs> it's, it's gone. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, it, it it sounds yeah very correct. Maybe for people who um, you know are fascinated by the technologies and would like to use them, uh, does. Are, are any of these technologies hosted in the AIC or are they more through collaboration? Uh, with um, the AIC has a FIBSEM uh, and we've just passed that sole uh, cryo SIM palm system over to their coming arms. 
And the whole intent is, is to make it available. I think hopefully in a post COVID world, this, you know, there'll be less barriers to it. Fantastic. Um, access to this level of FIBSEM is actually relatively easy if one can sort of prepare the samples. Uh, usually they're a piece of plastic, you can ship them and they're relatively easy to put in, quick to image. Uh, a correlative workflow is a little bit more involved because you have to then prepare the samples on site, vitrify them on a high pressure freeze. And uh, but yeah, they're, they're open to thoughts. It's uh, usually the first barrier is uh, does the biological needs or requirements sort of match the instruments, you know, and try to work out the details of that, you know, so that uh, it's all appropriate. And if it looks good and meaningful, I think it's something to explore. I think overall at Janili, we really want to sort of expand that kind of capability too. And of course there are third parties maybe working at liquid nitrogen temperature, uh, correlative workflows, you know, that are out there also that could be, you know, explored. I think a little bit of the unique thing here, we have it at, uh, you know, FIBSAMs that can image a little bit over stably over longer times, plus uh, the uh, lower temperature on the uh, cryo palm system can give us, you know, I think a nice two color localization. Uh, which is otherwise maybe a little bit difficult at nitrogen temperatures only. Because Indeed. that's, yeah, that's yeah. a little subtlety, which I, I didn't mention that uh, the floor fours, by going to the extra lower temperature, you know, other more red floor fours have better blinking properties and can give better localization images. So two colors benefit by going to the lower temperatures. Right. But still exactly. a lot to explore, you know, yes. maybe at some point, <laughs> fluorophores can be found that blink nicely in epoxy and this whole cryogenic stuff can go away. Um, <laughs> so if you want to make this obsolete, that's a path to go. 